We are here to talk about the American short story. It is arguably one of the most American of literary forms. Since 1915, the annual collections of the best American short story have been reflecting the finest voices of their times. Now, as the century draws to a close, one of our most respected writers has taken on what seems like an overwhelming task. He is selecting the best of the best. In this collection, the best American short stories of the century, Updike and co-editor Katrina Kennison have chosen 55 stories that represent the changing patterns of our country. Joining me now, Updike, of course, is John Updike, and I am pleased to have him here once again on this broadcast. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Now, <laughs> wow. You know, you're always learning something new about the people who come on your program. The thing that I did not know, we've done maybe 10, 15 interviews together, perhaps, is that you attended the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art at Oxford, years 1954 and 55. Mr. Updike did not want to be a novelist. novelist. He wanted to be a artist? I drew as a kid, like many kids, and <clears throat> thought I wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to work for Walt Disney. I wanted to then, I, my ambition advanced to wanting to be a New Yorker cartoonist. And uh, through the wishing to be a cartoonist, I began to read the New Yorker, actually, first the captions and then the stories. And so by the time I was, got out of college, I was somewhat headed in the direction of being a writer, but I was unexpectedly given a fellowship to study something somewhere in the British Commonwealth, a very strange liberty. I could have studied sheep herding in New Zealand, say, or, <laughs> or diamond mining in South Africa, but I chose... As long as you were on the Commonwealth. I chose to uh, study uh, drawing, fine art, art, in, the, in Britain, Great Britain, and uh, the Slade would not admit me. This was all in April, so it was running out of time, but the Ruskin School took me in. The Ruskin School was a somewhat quaint institution housed in a wing of the Ashmolean Museum, a very conservative, taught you how to paint, and this was in the heyday of abstract expressionism and all the... It also was one of the schools on the Korean War GI Bill, so I was not the only American there. There were maybe a third Americans, most of whom were dying to bust out and be Jackson Pollock. Instead, our teacher was trying to make us be Cezanne, these careful <laughs> little parallel strokes. So I did study, uh, study drawing and painting, and I'm the better man for it. But even by that point, it was just basically a way of giving my artistic side a kind of one last run around the park. I was writing, I was even being published. I wrote a couple of short stories that year that the New Yorker took. Do you think so. there's a connection between drawing and being able to write? I think Conrad wrote about the writer makes us see, see in italics. So I think there is something, many writers have it with varying degrees. A writer like Thurber or James Joyce, who became blind, perhaps teaches more to hear than to see. But in a writer like Conrad, there's a great visual component, you know, and I think the ability to visualize mm. is one of the tools it's good to have. What's the significance of the short story in the American literary? Well, uh, I think it is one of our things we do best, beginning with old Edgar Allan Poe and Henry James uh, and uh, Mark Twain, uh, maybe because we're a nervous nation on the move and the short story uh, can be absorbed in a fairly quick time and also can record a fairly short segment of experience. It doesn't need the scope of a novel, doesn't ask the time, so that by and large, uh, and then in this century you have Hemingway, uh, I think above all, but a number of very powerful and good short story writers who really were at their best in the short story. So there's something about American energy yeah. that I think, an American experience that I think gets into the short story. And today, in the year 1999, uh, are short stories strong? Are they being read? Are they being published? Uh, is there an enthusiasm about them? I think the answer to all those is uh, sort of yes but less. <laughs> uh, I think there's less market. Uh, I don't know where a young short story writer now uh, would go with his goods. When I was young in the 50s, I was able to support myself through short stories for a number of years. Uh, my novels didn't sell. I wrote them to see if I could write a novel. But it was the short stories sold to the New Yorker that actually put bread on the table. Now I don't think you can put enough bread on the table, no matter how good you are or prolific. Uh, the New Yorker, uh, Esquire magazines that used to run several now run one. Uh, so it's hard, but they continue to be written. There's some very good ones written, of course, but to me it's more like a poetry now. You write it because you want to. Hmm. Uh, you're trying to create something perfect and uh, you get it published where you can often for little or no pay. Is anything that's happened to the short story any different than what's happened to the novel? 
The novel, uh, in a way, seems to stagger on, although I think uh, the bestsellers are a little crasser now than they used to be. Uh, they've both taken a hit from the electronic media. People like you have made it, have taken away the segment of time that perhaps people used to read in. Yeah, late night or whenever. Whenever. Yeah. When do you read? I don't read often enough, but when I do read, it's generally uh, in, in the evening, yeah, after, after dinner. dinner right. I've never been an afternoon reader. I know I should be because it's a long stretch, and if I have a, a book I'm reading for a literary work of my own, yes, I can read it during work hours, but yeah. generally if I'm not writing, I tend to work in the yard or play golf or something else. I do, too. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. I mean, I read a lot as part of the job that I sure. have and the craft that I practice, but I don't read during the day on the weekends. You know, right. It's always you're outdoors and you're doing something that's much more physical. Probably better for the total person to do something physical outdoors, yeah. but it is true that then in the evening, by the time you get done with dinner and whatnot, you, a of to, wine, yeah. you tend to be getting a little <laughs> yeah. drowsy, so that, yes, uh, I'm afraid that even though I'm in the game, as it were, I don't read as much as uh, I should, uh, and there's a tendency to fall behind, both, both in m m magazines and contemporary books. Now tell me before I start talking about the criteria for the selection. Now, what did you do, and what did Katrina Kennison do? She read all th all uh, eighty odd, eighty four previous volumes of Best American Short Stories of the Year, beginning in nineteen fifteen. Uh, so she read somewhere over two thousand stories total. She presented me with a tenth of those, about two hundred. I asked to see some more authors that she hadn't included stories I remembered from my youth or whatever. I must have read maybe 240 in the end, um, and I winnowed it down to 55. But you could not include anything that was not on that list of right, before, right. so that's the reason for the omission of Thurber. Thurber, not on the big list. there weren't enough, and there, weren't, there wasn't any, to my amazement, there wasn't any John O'Hara. If, if there was Mr. Short Story in the first half of the mid-century, you would have thought it was John O'Hara. Again, is that Foley, or is I that think something it's, I, think, I don't think he turned uh, Foley on, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> and also, a lot of John's uh, short stories were very New Yorkerish, casual, so-called. They were takes, quick, maybe yeah. uh, five pages long, and uh, the editors tended to go toward the more substantial. Should efforts. we look at these as representative of American short stories or the best of American short stories? They're, I think, a selection uh, that I'm by no means uh, ashamed of. The best is a somewhat subjective term, whether it's used in any connection at all. Uh, this certainly is the best of the best, as far as I'm concerned. These were the best that Miss Kennison and I were able to come the up best. with out of the best that had been chosen by the preceding editors. Uh, you know, it's not entirely bad. It's, it's in some sense, it's limiting, yes, where's John O'Hara, where's Mary McCarthy? No Mary McCarthy. On the other hand, they, over the years, they did include various obscure writers, now forgotten, and some of them wrote wonderful stories that I was able to include in this. So, in a way, this brought up some little fish who were worth, and, worth some eating. Of them, some of them wrote some short stories that were rather well-written and didn't write much after that. Some were rather had brief careers, some had long careers, but have fallen into the great mulch of forgotten writers. And there's also this. It is not always the story, short story that they're best thought of. Fitzgerald, for example. Fitzgerald, he's generally in anthologies for something called B Babylon Revisited. Right. And uh, it, it was offered. It didn't make a best, and I really preferred the Hollywood story that I chose. I just thought it was better. I, I didn't go out of my way to include out-of-the-way stories by the old masters. You have Hemingway's The Killers, which is much anthologized, and Faulkner's uh, That Evening Sun Go Down, which is sort of the Faulkner chestnut in the anthologies. But I didn't see I should leave it out, because this may be the only such anthology the, uh, the reader ever reads, you know, and why exclude the best? So I tried to go for... Make sure that somebody that was the best that American letters had seen in the century was represented here if they wrote short stories. Right, right. It was within the parameters of the previous editors. I, right. try, I chose the best I could. Uh, and I wouldn't have undertaken the assignment, frankly, if I was just told to make an anthology of the best American short stories of the century. I don't have that kind of time. This took time enough, thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> to do that right, you'd have to read and read, wouldn't you? Yes. Read all of O. Henry, read all of Faulkner's well, short so stories. Well, so Kennison must have spent a lot of time reading. Kennison is a good reader. I hope she's a fast <laughs> reader, She's because uh, <laughs> she does a lot of work. Yeah. One of the things, we're going to go through this de de decade by decade, but one of the surprising things that comes out of here, there is no great 
collection of short stories that came out of World War II. For, I asked her, Katrina, isn't there some war stories? And she did find a few that had been run in the Colliers and so on, describing battle, but actually very little. In the end, I wound up with only two war stories, one of them by Philip Roth, who, like myself, was too young to have actually served, and another by one of Hemingway's wives. Um, oh, I've forgotten her name. Uh, it's flown out of my head, but... Uh, M Martha Gellhorn, forgive me, for Martha, uh, recently died, a wonderful mm -hmm. woman, but known mostly as a war, uh, as a journalist, right, mm -hmm. a correspondent, a daring woman. A... Right. Let's talk anyway, about... a good story that she wrote, and I was happy to include it. And the Philip Roth piece came out of the 60s. Yes, it did. Uh, let's talk about decade by decade. What about the teens? What can we say about short stories in the teens? A lot of immigrant experience, a lot of rural America, a very different America than we tend to meet now, and I chose three. Uh, all by authors that are not world famous, but the stories that moved me in some way. One story describes uh, farm wives, makes you feel what a lonely life they had, and how, insofar as they could, they banded together. But you feel the American size, I and mean, these farms are far apart. Yeah. It's not so easy to band together. The 20s? 20s were a smart alecky decade, and you got satire. You have Ring Lardner uh, there writing about uh, the middle class. Uh, you have Sherwood Anderson and Hemingway doing rather experimental work, trying to reform, reform the reform. And uh, uh, there is a, still a kind of innocence about them. Uh, there are the city people, Mencken and other smart Alex, poking fun of the country people, but you feel they all speak the same language. There's a kind of na national connection, the national family uh, still in effect, I felt. Uh... 40s, we talked about with the war. 30s, you could 30s, just say yeah. that there was a depression going on, although yeah. not every story reflects the depression, just like not every movie made in the 30s reflects the depression. A lot of them were kind of happy stories. But you, did, you do get a, a basically more sober, sober tone and less uh, satire. Uh, I think Saroyan, Saroyan's story came out of the 30s and is a wonderfully exuberant kind of riff that only he could have done. And then the 50s? Fifties, you get into when I was beginning to be a practicing writer, and uh, it's sort of the heyday of the New, New Yorker stories, suburban stories. Suburbia becomes a real place. John Cheever and others uh, make you feel it, and uh, the stories tend to be getting longer and a little uh, less hard-edged. Uh, somehow they're more poetic, a little more ambiguous. J.D. Salinger was a, a key figure in the short story of the fifties, and uh, he is notoriously reluctant to give permission to reprint and so there weren't very many stories. There was only one early pre-war story by him or, or pardon me, post-war. I didn't, I didn't think it was Salinger at his best and I thought he'd say no anyway. So there isn't any Salinger here but it's sort of the last, the last uh, heyday of the short story, a time when uh, people like Cheever could set up shop as basically short story writers and make a career of it. 60s? Well, they have the famous revolution, although all these uh, current events are rather slow to make their way into fiction. Uh, I think there's a Joyce Carol Oates story uh, that does show a middle-class child being lured out of, lured out of the home by a, what, a beatnik kind of guy. But basically, the 60s were just the 50s only extended uh, uh, experimental. There's more experimental. Barthelme, Donald Barthelme begins to write his own very special brand of pastiche in the 60s. 70s? What can you say? I don't know. The beginning to lose character in the 70s. Uh, uh, I'd almost have to look at the table of contents to remind myself of who's in the 70s. I may be in the 70s decade, or certainly I was a practicing writer then. Uh, there is one of yours. We can talk about that. Did, was this your selection, or did Katrina say to you, you've got to include this in? No, she didn't. She was kind of surprised I chose that one. Uh, I've been selected, I think, 11 times by, uh, by the best, so I had 11 stories of mine I could have chosen. I was attracted to this story because it just seemed, when I reread it, kind of sharp and funny and sad and suburban and me at my most updikean insofar as I can judge that. She Wait, was stop, stop. Most updikean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what does most updikean mean? What does it mean to be updikean? Well, I think when I was in my prime uh, so many years ago, uh, there was a kind of uh, music uh, out of imagery that I could get, a kind of a weave. This particular story deals with a couple, married couple breaking up, 
and it's about gestures, but it also is about the guy moves to Boston. He looks out at the skyscraper, which is shedding its glass. There was in Boston at the time. Hancock Tower was shedding its windows. Uh, various images, they interplay like music. I had this image in my mind of a short story should be a kind of a fugue with this theme and that theme and all mm -hmm. kind. Mm -hmm. And this story, I thought, did it. So I'm, I'm very pleased with this story. Also, it seems effortless. I think one of the things you look for in a short story is a sense of no sweat. Yeah. It should not feel like work yeah. to have written it or to read it. So it ought to be more pleasure than difficulty. It should move on its own grease somehow. I mean, it, it, should, yeah, it should slip along, slip along and surprise you with all it does to you in the end. What's the last one is who? Annie... Uh, Annie Prue. Annie Prue. Uh, who wrote a typically grim, strange story. Uh, <laughs> it's not the story that maybe I would have chose to end on, but it's a powerful story and does have her kind of inimitable effects in it. It's the half-skinned steer is a sort of mythical steer, appears in various legends of a steer that they think is dead and it's only stunned and they get the skin halfway off and then the steer comes to life and then runs around with its skull head, mm. eyeball, eyeball with no flesh around it. Can you picture that? Mm. I didn't want to picture it either, but uh, there's a lot of these stories that lead you to face things you'd almost rather not. Uh, Here, strong, strong stories they're called. Mm. When, Here is the criteria mm. you used. These were the rules according to Updike. Uh, all stories had to, to have appeared in the best American volume. Certain authors have to be included. These are your criteria. The selection should reflect the century with each decade given roughly equal weight. So therefore, that had a balancing effect yes. per se. Uh, all stories had to take place on the continent or deal with characters from the United States. Um, what caused you the most pain not to have included? Uh, I got down toward the end, and uh, I had chosen, I think, 68, and I couldn't go any further. I thought these were all... Wonderful. <laughs> so they said, no, it's too fat a book. 55 pretty, of Dyke. 55. Well, they agreed on 55. I think f f 50. They, they would have liked to have seen 50, but I... So, yes, there was a lot of, a lot of bloodshed. Uh, a story by Rick Bass, a story by... From Young, the New York Times? Uh, no, 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 the writer. Rick Bass yeah. writes about ecology, basically. Right. Right. This was a wonderful story about guys despoiling the wilderness, behaving badly but in the it didn't wilderness. Make it. And that's a very American theme. It didn't make it. In the end, it just didn't seem quite up to the ones that I was leaving in. Uh, my apologies to Mr. Bass. It was a Charles Baxter, another youngish, uh, 40-ish writer who... Uh, so, yeah, there was pain. <laughs> I felt pain. It was a little pain to cut James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. Sonny's Blues, which appears in many other anthologies, though, and in the end, it seemed uh, seemed a little a little long for what it did. Uh, story by Peter Taylor, a much admired Southern t Tennessee writer uh, who I knew and uh, liked. You couldn't help but like him or like his fiction too. But in the end, again, I couldn't find anything that seemed to deliver. Uh, sort of a leisurely writer, and uh, in a competition like this, uh, you know. You, only the quick, only the quick and the ruthless win out. <laughs> Survival of the fittest is what it came down to. I was exhausted when I was done and had the list drawn up finally. Because it, it is a lot of murder. I mean, uh, I had to kill three out of four stories that I read, and these were all good stories. Does this mean that you wouldn't like to be an editor? Not really, no. I don't see how they do it. And also to be an editor, you have to know your own mind. And to be a writer, you don't have to know it. But, you know, you have the difference between good and bad has to be sort of apparent to you, whereas there's that huge gray middle where it's almost good or has good things in it. And it'd be tough to be an editor for me. Would you just give me a minute? What is worth, what is with you and Tom Wolfe? <laughs> Nothing much. It's not really a romance. It's just a <laughs> just a brief fling. Uh, I, uh, I mean, you just went. That wasn't a, a harsh review. I didn't think I did. I did review a man in full. Some reluctance because my inkling was that I, I might not like it. The wolf has his gifts and his charms, certainly, and his strengths as a writer. But uh, that kind of wow, gee whiz. Uh, spelling things out, uh, pounding. It just isn't uh, my kind of fiction. And I, I sort of said that, although the book was in its way enthralling. I hope I, I said that also and kind of stunning in its ambition. It's a wonderful attempt to say it all, to show all kinds, all colors of Americans. 
existing in one city, Atlanta, uh, together. But in the end, uh, yes, I, I had to say a few adverse you things. You said more entertainment than literature, I think, is what you uh, I did suggested. feel that. I was, trying, I was groping for something that was, I felt, grievously lacking <laughs> in the whole Wolfian aesthetic, yes. And maybe that's a bogus distinction. After all, a lot of yesterday's entertainment becomes today's literature. Dickens was thought to be a fairly coarse number in his he day. He was entertainment in his day. Yes, as Tom Wolfe would point out. Uh, so I may be wrong, but uh, a reviewer, you have to say what you felt. I did as honestly and sweetly as I could. And uh, the book's uh, great success, of course, brought my sure. review into some attention. And the fact that Norman Mailer wrote a longer consideration coming down sort of about where mine did. You know, great but gifts, also great did, gifts did, but They just get mixed up with sort of New York awards dinners and stuff like that somehow, and reports and response or not? It's possible that my memory, being tenacious, remembers a rather unkind and flip piece that Wolf wrote about the New Yorker in a day when nobody was flip about the New Yorker. I remember him trying to rip the lid off the New Yorker when the lid was on very tight with a very privacy-minded organization, and Wolf waded in with the new journalism. It was really the future saying, I'm here, but we didn't know it at the time. And uh, so, uh, although some of Wolf's things uh, have charmed me since, uh, he does have to overcome that slight old, old wound of mine. But no, I... But is that fair for you to attack him? I mean, should you be reviewing... Tom Wolf, <laughs> if you have that old wound from, from the fact that he tried to lift the lid off the New Yorker that you love so deeply. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but it was the New Yorker begging me to review this book. I was conflicted. <laughs> uh, I was conflicted, so to... and I tried to give it a fair review. Uh, but maybe somebody else. Uh, I have met people who love that book, um, but I've met others who thought I was right. Uh, I'm not attacking the review. I'm just mm -hmm. to the point was it created such controversy all of a sudden. More than I was. There was more talk about the review than there was about anything else. As a reviewer, of as a reviewer, of one of my one of my early rules as a reviewer was don't review any book by anybody you know even slightly or any uh, you know. And yeah. probably it's a good review, but it's hard to remain as pure as one would one would like in this fallen world. I also, in looking at some things about you and being reminded of, of how extraordinary. A career it has been. Listen to this. Uh, the National Book Award in Fiction, 1963. The Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. American Book Award and National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction in 1982, all for Rabbit is Rich. National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism, 1984, for Hugging the Shore, Essays and Criticism. National Book Critics Circle Award in Fiction nomination, 1986, for Rogers' Version. Uh, it's been an extraordinary life. With uh, Rabbit has been very good to you, though, we'll say that. Right, if you take Rabbit away, I hardly won a thing. I mean, if you look <laughs> at that list, uh, it's Rabbit, not me, that they like. Uh, oh, no, uh, hardly, sir. I think so. The best, American, <laughs> <laughs> the best American short stories of the century. John Updike has waded in and taken a look at all those lists, going back to the teens in this century, and selected those and the criteria uh, that was he thought appropriate and put them together in this book. Uh, it reminds us how great short stories are and how much they're a part of the American experience. My thanks to John Updike. Back in a moment.